What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe Show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations 2020, Best Podcast News Award winner and 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethic Media Association. And I host the only online show in the world for dads and fathers that is sponsored by Dove Men Care and also co-sponsored by Dad Central Canada's National Fatherhood Organization. And I am the board chair for the Global Food and Drink Initiative, otherwise known as the GFDI. It is a multimedia not-for-profit that showcases Blacks in the diaspora that are doing their thing in food, wine, and travel. We're broadcasting live here on May 30th. Yes, the end of May is almost done. It, the month is almost done. And we're live on a Sunday afternoon. And as uh, we do on most Sunday afternoons, we have Black Canada Talking. And Black Canada Talking is a live online event that provides Black Canadians the opportunity to give their takes and POVs on stories that are of importance to them. This is the last Sunday of the month. So traditionally, what we do is we do our round table with our friends and panel. And today we've got Sarah, Warren, Cesar. Elle should be joining us probably in a little bit. She's been asked to take uh, another commitment that she, wouldn't, she wanted to get done in place of someone. So let's bring our three panelists on that we have. We got Sarah. Good afternoon, Dr. Vive, and happy end of African Unity, African Liberation Month. Wonderful. Right back at you. And we've got Cesar. Hey, Cesar, how are you? I'm good. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm yeah. Okay. 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 And Warren Clark, like I'm telling you, these three individuals and L, uh, they're, they are past busy. They're just on overdrive. So when I can get them once a month, I feel very privileged. But I hope everyone is having a good day, a okay year so far. And uh, what we're going to start off with, our first conversation topic, Unf this, this story has just rocked people's souls right around the world. The finding of 215 Indigenous young people's bodies underneath a school in the British Columbia area. This, like I was hosting a conversation last night for, with some people from the United States and they're saying, what's going on in your country? <laughs> so who would like to chat on this one first? Go ahead, Sarah. Sarah's been fired up for the last half an hour, folks. So just, just let her go. <laughs> so first I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming uh, to you from the uh, Algonquin, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin people. I'm on the Quebec side of that territory. And uh, I mean, I'm still grappling with, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I participated in, you know, a number of the marches with uh, survivors of the residential school um, experience, uh, nightmare, I would say. And so this just brings back the the trauma as someone experiencing their trauma like secondhand and just the idea that you would rape and you know um just meet such meet out such violence on such young human beings little kids apparently as young as four and then after they die from malnutrition or just you know the abuse you just you know, dig up graves and then you go and you bury them and then you don't tell anybody and then it stays there for God knows how long. How do you live with yourself? How do you live with yourself? It just sort of reminds me of the evil of, um, let's just say what it is, the evil of white supremacy and state-sanctioned violence like that, the lengths to which it will go. And what doesn't help is for me, it's sort of colliding in my head and in my psyche with the commemoration of Tulsa, which is a, another expression of this violent, naked, racial hatred. I'm going to stop there. Warren? You are on mute, Mr. Warren. Yes, it's, uh, thank you. I, I'm used to uh, StreamYard now because I've been on so many Zoom calls, right? So, um, Sarah, thank you for, for opening us up. Appreciate it. And thanks for sharing the space with me, Sarah. It's our first time speaking on the panel together, I think. Yeah, it is. Um, so much appreciated to you. 
Uh, and Caesar, always a pleasure. Um, you know, here's the thing. Um, you know, we we shouldn't be shocked. And I say this with respect, not to disrespect um, Indigenous communities. And I say we shouldn't be shocked because this is another uh, steering of its ugly head of white supremacy, just echoing a little bit of what um, Sarah mentioned. Uh, but the, the extent of how dangerous and manipulative and uh, and um, on, and this ongoing uh, structural violence that's been happening in this country, particularly. Now, Sarah, I understand that you had uh, coupled and conflated uh, Tulsa respectfully, um, and I have, I'm always of mind to let's always keep our conversation focused on Canada for one reason, one reason only, is let's not give them a pass because there's too many moments, and we're gonna talk about George Floyd in a moment, I know it's one of our subtopics. There's too many moments where we look to the United States and say, well, well, it's not as bad, bad over there, not saying you said that. Or we try to say, well, it's on comparison too. No, it's, we have our own concerns. We have our own issues when it comes to anti-indigenous and anti-black racism in this country. This is just another example. Let me give you a, a, something, a, a situation that happened to me this, this, uh, this week, actually. I was in a meeting, and a, one of the participants in the meeting I was um, a, a sharing space with said uh, they were talking about their, you know, their home was, was built by colonizers, right? And they said uh, these great colonizers. And I said, I said, excuse me? <laughs> what do you mean by great colonizers? <laughs> I, I, never, I never heard the expression. But here's an example here in our Canadian moments that we are using words that there are indirectly, unconsciously, but consciously and directly giving a pass to these white settler colonizers who has done something like this that we found out today with the 215 young people who died. So this is, a, this is another example, another reminder that Canada's backyard stinks and it has been stinking for many, many years. Now, here's, here's the, and something, Sarah, you and I were speaking backstage respectfully, you know, who, accountability, that's the word for me when it comes to this. How do we, how do we really right the wrong as Canadians? But more so, and I'm going to call the name, how does Justin Trudeau and his government lead the charge to right the wrong? How does that happen? What does that look like? You know, we already have a sitting prime minister who is actually, who is not actually, who committed and wore blackface and brownface in, in, uh, in public. So the, 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 you know, this is another um, um, move that I'm, I'm trusting instead of him going on, on Twitter or, or, or these social media sites and just saying, I'm sorry, this has happened. What next? Do we really want to get rid of anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism in this country? Or do we want to continue saying, you know, we saw it, we, I'm sorry to hear it, let's move on with our lives. I don't know, Caesar. What do you think? Uh, I think alongside what you just said, um, but why be surprised? There's no surprise. This is just. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if what's more surprising is the number of children in regards to that residential school. I don't know if what would make uh, so many more uh, people upset is uh, the fact of uh, so-called apology from the archdiocese when actually they just keep representing the same institution of colonization, of um, basically uh, colonizing and also uh, turning Christians, uh, all the savages uh, as uh, indigenous people worldwide, not just in Canada or the US, but worldwide have been represented and as you know, by extension, us black people as well. I, I stand in sympathy and solidarity to our indigenous brothers and sisters in Canada, but let's also not forget, and Sarah said it so well, uh, in linking with the Tulsa massacre in the United States that is not taught in schools. So many massacres all over Africa, from Kenya to Cameroon, Nigeria, et cetera, et cetera, white supremacy, because let us not lose focus on residential schools, the church, no, it's beyond that. It's white supremacy in all institutions. How many children, women, and men who are not white have they killed worldwide? And to what extent are we daring 
to uh, chase for that truth, to chase for the reparations, but also to educate our own people to stand up truly with that fear in speaking the truth. The bodies are there, they're already dead. The only way we can honor them is to stand up and speak for them. This is part of Canada's shame. This is no part of the postcard Canada likes to send to the Haitians coming here, the Africans coming here, the Arabs and the Asians coming here as some type of, you know, number three or number one uh, country to live in by the United Nations. No, this is Canada's reality that they try to hide by always pointing the finger to the United States. Mm -hmm. So I stand, and I know I'm not the only one, I stand in sympathy and solidarity to our indigenous sisters and brothers for the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, and also the missing and murdered indigenous boys and men. I'd, I'd also like to, um, since, since um, Warren very rightly brought up the Trudeau government, yes, the residential schools did not happen under his government, but I don't care because at the end of the day, the white people who came after that era or whatever, in one way or another, have continued to um, oppress, suppress, and commit violence against Indigenous First Nations, Inuit, Métis. One thing I would like to see for the government of Canada to stop fighting all the organizations that are fighting to make sure that our Indigenous children have the same quality of, is it education they were looking for and health care? Because the government of Canada, in our names, spends millions of dollars fighting these cases after it's been proven that, yeah, there are inequities in the way Indigenous children are served, whether it's on or off reserve or whatever. Here is the case. Here are our lawyers. We've gone all the way to the Supreme Court. What the hell are you doing fighting these people with our tax dollars? You're wrong. Make it right. Give these children even the basics of what they need. Another thing I'd like to see, the, the water. Something as basic as water. Like improve while you're, we're seeking justice for the missing, murdered, and buried, let's also get social justice right now for the living, for the ones who don't have adequate um, mental health services, who don't have clean access to clean water, who don't have good schooling, and the ones who continue to be beaten up and roughed up by the RCMP. Why don't we do that instead of performative you know, actions? Okay. I think I'm going to stop because I, <laughs> I need I need a Valium or something. I'm so. How, so mm. how should Black Canadians respond to this story? Warren, yeah. Go ahead, Warren. Educate yourself. We don't know enough about this Canadian histories in our communities, our Black communities. We don't. We also need to also uh, acknowledge that. In the barbershop talk, you know, it was which, which happened last month. Yeah, last month. You know, one the theme was uh, respecting and appreciating our, our elders, which we don't do enough of in our Black communities. We need to we need to learn from our elders to understand. You know, what happened in our past is also happening in our future in our, our contemporary moments, and could also happen in our future. You know, I'm going to always come from the education lens because that's that's what I do as a, in a career. I'm an educator. But, you know, there's, there's other ways of before political action, I'm going to always side with encouraging people to, you know, seek knowledge and how to, how do we understand these oppressive practices? You know, what are the social oppressions at play? Um, and how do we mobilize social justice to actually seek true uh, uh, social liberation for people who are marginalized in this country? You know, that's, that's what I would suggest. Um, I'm not sure what uh, Sarah or Cesar would, would add to that uh, in terms of adding value. Please, uh, go ahead. I'll go after you. No, I'll, I'll go after you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just say uh, we have to never forget where we are. I mean, 
<laughs> Canada is not the worst country to live in by far, of course. But there is a fundamental problem if we satisfy ourselves with being black, having access to uh, clean drinking water. And again, that's relative because some black communities, when you think of notably Africville and uh, communities impacted by environmental racism, don't have access to that. But we cannot be content with having access to clean drinking water while the indigenous, too many, not all of course, but too many indigenous people of this very nation where we are in, by immigration, some as descendant of US slavery, those indigenous people of this time do not have clean drinking water. Uh, educating ourselves regarding our own past, our own leaders, but also standing up for our community must come with an acknowledgement of uh, the disproportionalities and disparities affecting through systemic racism and anti-indigenous discrimination those who are here in the land because there are so many uh, similarities and uh, intersections of oppression affecting them that also oppress us. That's what I would say. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, the, you know, the, 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 the colonial background from which we come, especially myself and uh, of, you know, those of us from the continent, like it's it's yesterday, like it's not, you know, a very <laughs> remote and far away uh, past. But one thing I would like to say is that ever since uh, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission, we went through that whole exercise and that history was even dug up in the first place. I, I have to admit, um, even working alongside, you know, in the community with First Nations uh, people, I really had no idea of the extent of the res residential school system and how many generations it has impacted and how it finds expression today. And what I was glad to see uh, over the last few years, and interestingly, during the pandemic is more of a coming together between the black community and the indigenous communities here in Ottawa and on this side in Gatineau, where uh, there were several events where um, Black youth and Indigenous youth got, got together uh, in events where they talked about racism and their experiences with racism together and discovered that uh, they really have a great interest in building the solidarity between them. So Yes, you know, learning about this history, learning about it deeply, not just what, you know, a CBC report or a CTV clip or no, the actual really going, you know, to the indigenous organizations, the Wabano Center, et cetera, um, and find, finding out what really happened, preferably from the people who are descendants of those who experienced that. And after you've done that, if you're old enough to vote, when you are voting, always keep at the back of your mind, what is so-and-so's position, not just on the black community, but what is their position on issues affecting our first peoples, right? What are, what are conservatives saying about that? What are the NDP saying about that? What is their record on that? Are they likely to deliver on that? Build that into your decision at the ballot box. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Great start, everyone, watching Black Canada Talking, May 30th. And unfortunately, we only do these once a month, and there's so much stuff that goes on in a month, let alone in a day these days. So we're going to do some catching up on, you know, it's just over a little over the George Floyd murder and the movement it sparked. But what has changed? What has changed in the last year? Who would like to start on this conversation topic? I'll let someone else start. <laughs> I, I have a whole list of things. But... Let, let Warren put up his hand. Warren, go for it, man. Yeah. You're on mute again, Warren. Oh, no. so there we go. Here we go. Oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry, folks. It's all right. No worries. Um, you know, not much, in my opinion. Not much. Um, we're still seeing moments and senses of anti-black racism 
We're still seeing moments of not only anti-black racism, but that's coupled with sexism, particularly this is uh, where you were still seeing m many uh, African sent men who are facing, uh, you know, police brutality. They're facing moments of, you know, discrimination based on their gender, uh, not only in, in uh, among police, but in the education system. So we, we say, um, you know, what has changed? The only thing we can say is that corporate corporate companies and not nonprofit organizations are taking more of a stand and saying let's uh, let's practice anti-oppression, anti-racism frameworks uh, to educate our staff, right? Some of these um, some of these you know um, you know moments where these organizations are doing that, some of them are just doing a one and done training. As an example, I'm not trying to segue too far. I'm just going to give an example here, but there's no practice and understand how to be anti-racist. How to understand how what anti-black racism does for African descent people. So if we don't practice, we don't put anything to, into practice of actually understanding how to dismantle anti-black racism. How could we ever get to the, the moment of you know really gaining a sense of people feeling uh, feeling a belonging in this Canadian society? Now I know the George Floyd murdering of George Floyd happened in, in the United States. So we can't we, we can't forget to look the location of where this happened because the United States is a different country and different types of uh, moments of anti-black racism, particularly on, on black men bodies. But we're still seeing moments where they're screaming up no justice, no peace for different, um, you know, black men who've been murdered in, in the last few months, right? So what what is really changing the narrative? All we know, for example, is that, you know, we have a new, or oh, not we, the United States has a new administrator, administration, sorry, that's, you know, speaking to the, the, the tune of we want to make uh, make change, but yet has not signed any legislation to make change, right? You know, they've they've signed in the anti-Asian uh, hate bill. I'm sorry if I'm uh, mispronouncing or, or not saying that correctly. Um, but yet there, there's the, the uh, Emmett Till bill that was supposed to be, that was, has been 22 years in the make or plus, or plus that, um, has not been signed to legislation. So when we think about black lives, particularly these Western nation states, what does it really matter? What does it count for? You know, and you know, the thing is, you know, we have to also keep in mind who is representing black lives in these spaces, right? Are, do, do they know enough information, know enough education on how to, to seek proper ways to mobilize mobilizing policies to actually give um, black Canadians or black Americans a sense of belonging in these countries? Or we just uh, continue to, to, to mention something um, that sounds like anti-black racism, but really is not mobilizing any change. So in my opinion, I don't think my, many, there's been a, a significant push to actually address and to say that, you know, we need to actually consider what's at stake here when we keep on pressing uh, African descent people. That was my two thoughts. Thanks, Warren. Who's next? So I'll, I'll just quickly um, talk about what I've seen change, like from my experience. So first of all, Black History Month this year was just crazy. Uh, I have never been busier actually since last summer. And I'm sure it's the same with, you know, other community activists and advocates, etc., who have to, you know, do these presentations on Black history, culture, etc. So, you know, busy, busy, busy. And the fact that everything was virtual because of the pandemic, um, you know, there was more of, of a demand, but like uh, Warren was saying, you know, the one and done phenomenon where, you know, after giving presentations to DND and uh, the revenue agency and this other uh, department and that organization or whatever, you're still hearing about these federal public servants who have to launch a class action suit against the same government of Canada um, because there's no accountability for mostly white superiors who deprive them of career advancement, fair working conditions, or who just plain harass them. So another thing that um, I saw as well, uh, mainstream media all of a sudden seemed to figure out that if Black Lives Matter, Black commentators matter, Black viewpoints matter. And all of a sudden, you got all these Black commentators on mainstream media. I also like the fact that um, Black employees in different organizations and companies and institution, institutions came 
forward publicly to talk about their experience with anti-Black racism. And some of them included uh, some of uh, my colleagues in the mainstream media. Here in Ottawa, we had uh, Stefan Keyes, uh, who, who did some amazing, um, who gave some amazing testimonial. Tracy Moore over there in Toronto, uh, and Adrian Harewood here in Ottawa as well. More black content creators, because now all of a sudden everybody wants black stories. Everybody wants to know what black people think. Blah blah blah. And with this sort of shift in looking at who should be telling the story more black content creators came out and created their own uh, avenues. Dr. Vibe, you've been, you know, you've been at this for a while, but with what happened last year, for example, we have Black Canada talking, and now there's more interaction between different black communities across the country, thanks to a podcast like yours, of course, um, because of the mental, the trauma, um, someone like uh, Nicole Waldron, Mm -hmm. uh, created her Victory Speaks uh, podcast, mm -hmm. which sort of gave, uh, you know, an outlet for Black people to, to share their expertise. And all of a sudden, oh, we need Black leaders in our organizations. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, yes. So now we, we have to go beyond the performative, or at least make it look like we're going beyond. And we need to put you know, black people in charge of something. So all of a sudden you had all these black people who were in charge of cultural diversity and inclusion and blah, 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 all over the place. So, and this is not to knock anybody at all. Uh, these two women I'm gonna mention are people I like um, here at the National Gallery of Canada, which, which was so white, okay? National Gallery, so white, oh, a senior communications person is a black woman. Uh, the person in charge of the diversity and inclusion is a black woman. Over at the National Arts Center, they created the position of, you know, diversity and inclusion, National Arts Center. I have to say though, the National Arts Center had already started working on the diversity and inclusion, but what happened with George Floyd kind of just accelerated things. So now we, we're going to have black theater, a black theater uh, section at the National Arts Center after the indigenous one. And, and on and on, I'm sure there, there are other black people in leadership uh, that came, but I have to think that that was partly because of, you know, what happened with last year and the things. Then of course, uh, we talked about the budget. Remember we talked about the budget? So they had to build in, you know, initiatives. We're still waiting to see where that's gonna go. The budget just came out in April, but, uh, you know, organizations uh, like the philanthropy, uh, the black philanthropy organization that's supposed to disperse money to help black led organizations uh, serve our community, especially with the pandemic and you know the needs on the ground not being that well understood by white-led mainstream, uh, that became very important as well. And then here in Quebec, in, in my province, uh, despite our premier, uh, Mr. Systemic Racism Denying François Legault, <laughs> uh, you had in Montreal, uh, Mayor Val Valérie Plante, who decided to create this uh, division or directorate or whatever it is, to specifically address anti-Black and BIPOC racism. She put a woman of color in charge and now she's hired a, a former, a, a Black former police officer to also be uh, working there uh, at, in, in that uh, division. So there, there has been some cosmetic progress, but it's going to take at least a decade to see any sort of real uh, tangible result. Warren's, Warren wants to come in. Go ahead, Warren. That's it. We still got to hear from Cesar, so go ahead, Warren, if it's quick. Yeah, really quick. Cesar, I don't mean to you know, jump in. Um, no, sir, I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, I'm going to add value or I'm going to be, you know, um, you know, critiquing positively here and then do no harm approach. 
you know, when we when I hear you speak about the advancements that are happening, which are good, I'm also hear, hearing capitalism. I'm hearing there's a huge benefit of now marketing black. You know, I'll give you the example. One of the things, I'm from Toronto originally, and moving to Ottawa was a culture shock. Yeah, really quick, Caesar, really, really quick. And one of the things that I've, I've noticed here in Ottawa is there's a dire need to then give pets rights. Dogs have rights. Cats have rights. And when I think about it, these rights that you give these animals, no, and this is no point intended. Animals are, are cool. Like, if you have an animal, great, you know? But they're money makers, you know? To get the, the, the pet groomed, the dog food, the, 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 the toys, you know, the, the, the pet smart uh, businesses out here, there's huge establishments. Huge. You go in there, you could you could easily spend at least two grand and, and walk with only a bag or two. Just for your pet. And the reason why I'm saying all this is because they figured out capitalism has figured out a way to exploit animals. Right? And this is what and I'm saying this as an example, I'm not calling black people animals. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying here is that capitalism has now found a way to exploit black bodies. By using capitalism as the engine, this is what this is. Capitalism has the best. Everybody's making money off of black of black misery, but yet we can we, we're not seeing the real change. I, I keep shifting back to education because it's important. We're not seeing the real change where we need to see in high schools in the in the curriculum. How come we can't speak about black Canadian histories as uh, part of the curriculum? Why can't we? That's free information. Why should it should it not? Are we not Canadian? So when we have this conversation, I think it's really important for us to be really critically engaged as to why these are happening. Hence the reason why I started off my talk with, I don't think anything is happening. I just think people are getting a lot of money, which is good. I think people like you should be not only known um, during February, I think people should know Sarah throughout the, throughout the year and here in Ottawa. You've been doing amazing work here in Ottawa. Why can't, they, why can't everybody know who Sarah is? But yet they only know you during Black History Month, the majority of these people. Why is that? the people are making money. Let's change money. So sorry, Cesar, I just wanted to mention that. I think it's really important to keep capitalism in mind when you think about these black advancements. Cesar? Uh, <laughs> um, Brother Warren and Sister Sarah make absolutely great and valid points. But before I begin regarding what has really changed one year later, George Floyd, allow me to... Uh, uh, give my condolences and uh, all my Black and Pan-Africanist sentiments to the family of uh, the Black Lives Matter activists in London, England, uh, Sasha Johnson, who was shot in the head. Um, it's a loss for the community there. It's a loss for the Black community worldwide, as she stood up. Uh, regarding addressing the question specifically, um, Allow me to start with the negative. The negative that would say nothing has changed. Uh, right after uh, George Floyd and even still today, black people are still being disproportionately shot and killed in the USA as in Brazil. We know very well about the no-knock raids that even occur in Ottawa and the deaths that it has caused. And also a lot of, uh, how can I put it, uh, police behaviors that may seem to change on paper, but in terms of the realities of people, aka black people and indigenous people in brackets, nothing has changed. Uh, we definitely should talk about corporate and political involvement in terms of uh, an adaptation of language, in terms of you know systemic racism and equity becoming paramount to any good speech and sometimes it's blacked out at every paragraph, but concretely in terms of actions, in terms of policies and procedures, not much has changed. When I say not much has changed, I want to be careful. Change is not about performative actions or even just to create uh, an equity, diversity, and inclusivity office or department with a black face. Change is to give authority and power in that department to that person to bring concrete changes and transformation of society. It's a journey. It's not something that I would expect anyone, black included, to just adapt to by snap of the finger. But if we are speaking of concrete measures, and allow me to take the point of Brother Warren, 
dogs and cats in the Western world are better protected than black people. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way back to the 17th century, Le Code de Noir of Louis the 14th. It's a fact that many people dislike, but guess what? A white cop is more likely to go to jail for shooting a dog than for shooting a black person. Mm -hmm. On a more positive news, um, the cautiousness that's shifting must be recognized. Although last year, so many people coming out to protest, not just in the US and Canada, but worldwide, yes, absolutely, uh, uh, we must mention the fact that there was a COVID, uh, that there is a lockdown, COVID, and people getting bored, no entertainment or no sports on TV, but also the violence, the gratuitous violence of what uh, uh, that murderous cop, Derek Chauvin, did. But we must go beyond that moment. Uh, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, and so many other names, as here in Canada, Abdi Rahman Abdi and Regis Gorchis back at Solomon Teka in Israel, uh, the five black youth who got gunned down by police uh, celebrating their first paycheck. Uh, so many names, Adama Traoré in France. It must not be a question of the moment, we must build on it, and building on it ultimately is beyond having whites and other non-blacks walk with us. It's beyond having some promise or even delivery of a few dollars, even if it talks about millions, very often government dollars come with conditions and often reimbursement. It must be about the building and the strengthening of our communities through uh, not only education, but a true sense of identity and community that must come in the recognition and acknowledgement of our blackness, our rich history. We were not just kings and queens in the past. We were also merchants. We were also craftswomen and craftsmen. We were spiritual people before the religions came to break us, before the politics divided us. And as so well said right in Canada, we are still living in a nation where the leader of the conservative party uh, does not recognize systemic racism, just as the prime minister of Quebec, despite countless uh, reports and testimonies. So let us not point the finger always to the US or you know, remember that it's worse in Brazil or even think that in Africa it's so much better because it's a black continent, I'm sorry. Uh, Africans, aka black people in Africa, are victims of racism in Africa by the Chinese, just as the whites. And if you're a white person in Africa, you're more likely to get a job than the black indigenous person in Africa. Yep. Yeah. This is this is the craziness of the situation we're talking with, and I hope we will have time to talk about the Israel-Palestine conflict affecting black communities. Yeah. Just real quick, um, I'm I'm also hoping that yes, the whole George Floyd thing was over police brutality. But right now it's two pandemics. It's, you know, the police brutality and the inequities that keep people that look like us impoverished and in precarious living conditions and, and jobs. So I'm sort of concerned that um, you know, my colleagues in the mainstream media are not paying enough attention to everything else that's associated with anti-Black racism. You know, the redlining, the inability to get funding. Our filmmakers, their inability to get funding for their projects, the way they're juried out of competitions, uh, people who are passed over, uh, the lack of representation in newsrooms so that, you know, our issues, our successes, et cetera, go to the bottom, thereby reinforcing uh, the stereotypes. So, you know, I'm hoping that people will remember that anti-Black racism is not just police brutality. It's, it's also, you know, the employment situation, health disparities, the problems in the schools, et cetera. One thing I didn't mention though as well is that uh, there seems to be more support for uh, non-police response to mental health crises as well. So I'd like to just send a shout out to 613819 Black Hub. 
uh, here in uh, the Ottawa Gatineau area for the work they've been doing to try and really push that so that we don't get situations like what happened to um, Ms. Korczynski Paquette. Okay, fantastic. We're gonna take a very, very quick break to let our panelists have a little bit of a breath because we've got some more incredible conversation coming up. And on the other side of the break, we're gonna talk about COVID-19 in Canada. Where, where are we with the infection rates in the black community? So, hey buddy, stay it's Dr. locked. Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award winning Dr. Vibe show. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here. What is up, everybody? It is Dr. Vibe here. Just had an awesome experience. Uh, he is a really good interviewer. The conversations that we have and the passion that he has for people and helping people. So smoothly that you would have thought that we knew, had known each other for years. Big shout out to Dr. Vibes. I had the opportunity, the pleasure and the privilege to join him last evening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And you can check out more great content like this on my website. Also follow me on social media. Remember, it's Dr. Vibe the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations. And remember, live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get small to get stronger. Block assumptions and aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. Love, faith, and respect. And remember to give yourself grace. We are back. Back with, oh, hey. Elf in the house. Hey. Elf Jones, how are you, Elf? Hello, all. Sorry to be late. I made it. I'm glad we're still here. I got worried when I saw all this like outro stuff. I was like, no. <laughs> no, it's all good. How you doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, whole team in the house. It's nice to see you back, Warren. Sarah, amazing to see you. And Cesar, of course. So, hi, hey, everybody. <laughs> we're going to get you in right quick on our next conversation topic, or maybe if you need a break. We're no, gonna I'm, good. I'm good. Let's keep okay. going. All right. So, Talk about, let's talk about COVID in Canada, COVID in the Black community. What are your thoughts and what are you hearing from your community when it comes to COVID? Hmm. Well, okay, I just got here and I'll jump in. I just got vaccinated, so I literally, we're slow here, so it just came down to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, this has been a really interesting landscape. There's a Black woman on Facebook who does like God's work. She's like a Black doctor and she literally just goes around and tries to like encourage Black people to get the vaccine and has to intervene in a lot of conversations. And one of the things you see is, of course, um, and this is no mystery to us, our long history of being mistrustful of the system because of the long history of medically experimenting on us, whether that be the first hysterectomy is done on enslaved black women, right? So we were the subjects of this experimentation. And of course that doctor statue was only recently taken down from in front of Central uh, Park. Um, obviously Tuskegee, um, obviously our rightful distrust of the government, but it's become a sort of interesting battleground in terms of how black you are, right? So there's this kind of idea of like, um, where the battle lines have kind of been set. Like if you get the vaccine, you're being like less black because you're like buying into a government thing. Um, and so I found that really interesting. Like um, not the narrative around why we might not trust people, why we might be hostile to the medical industry. Like that's well established because we get treated racistly by healthcare professionals. Doctors believe that black people suffer less pain. Like educated doctors come through medical school and the majority of them believe that we have thicker skin and you know we suffer pain differently. And these are all enslavement era ideas that are still active. But yeah, what I found challenging is that the ground has sort of ceded to that kind of existential ground where we start challenging how black each other is. And yeah, there's definitely in my community, at least there's a, a huge kind of discourse, kind of like, oh, if you got the vaccine, you're a sheep you're stupid, you're, you know, you, you can do that. Um, and then of course the reverse, which is the, the use of policing um, by the state in order to, instead of um, teaching us how to you know, care for each other and instead of addressing our concerns, just using force. So the other thing that's really happening right now in my community conveniently, because of course it's the year anniversary of George Floyd and then Regis and then Chantal who was killed by the police out here, the indigenous woman, Rodney Levi, right? So. Um, I find it convenient that we're under a, the longest state of emergency in Canada and they literally banned protests. So whereas Toronto came out for Palestine, Toronto was able to come for Regis, like Palestinians were in their cars having a car rally and got ticketed by our police that was sent on an illegal injunction. Um, so I find that interesting as well. So on the one hand, I'm like concerned about the way that 
we're engaging in health and how dangerous that is for our community. But then I also think that that mistrust is being further sown by officials that want to use force and compulsion around whether that's vaccines or social distancing, rather than actually bringing us to a collective space where we could possibly speak with each other. So those are my thoughts. But. Okay. Who want, good, good start off. Who wants to jump in and follow up with that? <laughs> Warren is on mute again. <laughs> Can't break a tradition. <laughs> okay. Oh, nice to see you again. So it's always a pleasure. Uh, it's been too long. I need to catch up. Um, what do I think? Ellie, you're very lucky. I, I've been trying to get my vaccine. All right. Let's be, I, I, let's, I have been trying. Um, literally, there are no available appointments in Ottawa at all. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they're just scanning my health card and they're like, no, nah, not this guy. Uh, I don't know. That was, that was a joke. No. Um, see, I just, I guess I just um, added not so good stuff to the conversation. Anywho, moving on. Um, I really think the, I, I agree. I think uh, with Elle, I think the, the vaccines are important. Um, you know, just today I'm going to be vulnerable with the crowd and I, I trust my vulnerability is not going to be exploited here. Um, just today, my, my 18 year old daughter has COVID, right? She called me today and she's like, I've got it. I'm scared and I don't know what to do. So, you know, I don't say this to um, pull heartstrings here, but um, it is important when it hits home. Uh, that's when a lot of people, um, I'm not going to say including myself, but a lot of people that I've come across thus far have said, oh my gosh, this thing's real. We have to do something about it. You know, uh, for the last, uh, I'm going to more speak from experience um, because I think this is the experience is the best teacher, um, all for yourself. But you hear, you hear, you hear from me. It's coming right from live and direct, right? And you know, my aunt has been in, hospitalized since January, literally in the hospital, and uh, fighting infection after infection. Um, and thank goodness she got her vaccine before it got worse, right? Um, because she was in the hospital when it was the height of the pandemic, uh, the third wave. So, and then I also have friends who work in the hospital who tell me it is bad, right? I think what it is for a lot of people, particularly in our black communities, now I'm going to segue back to the general part of the conversation and take me out of the purview, is that it's 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 seeing is to believe it. It's also um, what Elle was alluding to or mentioned, it, it's, it has to, from a religious perspective, um, in our black communities, uh, many folks in our black communities, I should say respectfully, uh, in terms of not wanting or considering to take a vaccine because this is the devil's work, right? Um, and I'm not here to, you know, uh, tell anybody yay or nay. I'm going to tell you from experience and my own viewpoints on what you, uh, based on what I'm going through. I said very clearly, I'm going to be responsible for self, and I'm going to, I'm going to get the vaccine. I think it's important that. We figure we, we know what's at stake here, right? This is not a, a sickness or a cold that you just get over. This is something that's plaguing the entire world. If you're paying attention to places like India, India is being hit very hard, right? If you're paying attention to places you want to talk about Canada, Manitoba is being hit very hard right now, right? Hospitals are being overrun by this this disease. Um, and you know what? Like This was something that I don't think anybody was expecting to happen. Let's just call a spade a spade, right? Man-made or, 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 or nature, doesn't matter. At this point, we need to figure out how are we going to keep uh, keep ourselves safe and keep ourselves healthy. Now, the other point, I don't mean to dominate here, but this is an important uh, um, uh, thing to consider as well. You know, there are people, all right, that are going on social media and telling you the, the, that the, the negative stuff about taking this vaccine, right? Right. You know, there's a one popular guy. I'm not going to mention his name because mention his name, you give him, you give him fame. So we're going to mention his name, right? You know, going around from city, Canadian city to Canadian city, talking about the, you know, not taking the vaccine and the propaganda and the government and, and this. Folks, you are your own individual. Do your research. Read. Listen to these shows. Make an informed decision for self. I can't tell you to take the vaccine, like I mentioned earlier. I won't do that. But what's really important is that how do you remain safe? particularly in a pandemic. Don't think about the stores are closed and you can't go buy the new drawings. You buy them online anyways. I've been doing that. But needs to say, <laughs> right? it's not about buying the new, buying the new you know, T-shirt for the summer, right? It's not about just focusing on how do I get to Canada's Wonderland. 
It's about how do you can sustain a healthy lifestyle moving forward, longevity, right? Think about these things, right? It's important for not only yourself, but your loved ones as well. So I'm going to stop there because I said a mouthful. Thank you. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, you are asking about uh, statistics, which is startling. I've just seen some for Toronto. 70, 79% of people who contracted COVID between mid-May and end of November 2020, racialized, Black or South Asian, okay? And if you look at, you know, where the infection rates are the highest, Peel Region, who lives there? You know, Brampton, who lives there, right? Certain parts of Toronto, who lives there? In my province over here in Quebec, again, the concentration of cases and uh, number of hospitalizations and ICU, they, they look like this and South Asian. Uh, uh, where is that? Montréal Nord, Saint-Michel, uh, Notre-Dame-de-Grâce, uh, Côte-des-Neiges. That's where you're going to find a very, very high concentration. And it's only, you know, sort of late in the game, they started mentioning the compounding reasons why. We tend to be in those you know, face-to-face uh, -face occupations, the quote-unquote essential workers, we're driving the buses, the metro, we're working, you know, uh, the low-wage low jobs at grocery stores, we're going to be the orderlies and we're going to be the janitors and, and all, of, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. One, two, we're going to live in, you know, uh, congregate settings with, you know, multiple family members in one small space because we can't afford anything else. We don't have the luxury of, oh, we're going to go isolate here, there, and everywhere. Late in the game uh, for the GTA, the Ministry of Health, you know, uh, and thanks to the urging, I believe it was Taibu that kind of, and uh, Tropicana and them that said, look it, they need somewhere to isolate. You can't tell them, oh, you need to quarantine when there's no way for them to go and they can't afford a hotel. So, you know, uh, I know in Ottawa, they started funding, you know, like hotel rooms where you could go quarantine, et cetera, uh, without having, you know, actually without having to pay and specifically set aside for the black community. But in terms of the vaccine hesitancy, that right now I'm seeing it's our big, big, <coughs> our big hurdle. And one thing I was glad to see, although it was kind of late in the game, uh, was all of our Black healthcare professionals really, really, really stepping up. Dr. Upton Allen uh, out of Toronto and a lot of our doctors here at the University of Ottawa, uh, Faculty of uh, Health Sciences, uh, Dr. Uh, what's his name, Kwadjo Kiramantang, who's on TV all the time and has been since the vaccines were available and the authorities realized that here in Ottawa realized that what is wrong with some black people? Well, some black people are not seeing some black people talking to them about the vaccine. And when they see medical professionals, they don't look like that. So they're not likely to listen. Now, apparently, the uptake is better now in this Ottawa Gatineau area because we have been attending all these different town halls by medical professionals who actually break it down to us properly with the science and, you know, they tell us the side effects. They, you know, they tell us, you know, who should take this, who should take that, et cetera, et cetera. But all of them, everybody, the same message. You need to get vaccinated the same way you get your MMR and all of those others so that you don't get conditions that become chronic. And this, in this case, it can kill you. And it seems to be working. The, the, the vaccination rate is uh, improving. However, like you mentioned, uh, Warren, there we still have to contend with these people who are online spreading this ridiculous misinformation. And what people need to ask themselves is, what do they have to gain by doing this? Are they getting extra clicks because people are, you know, like you have to wonder what, you know, they would be gaining from this. I'll let Cesar speak. Warren wants to say something. Go ahead, Warren. And you're on mute as usual. Oh, boy. <laughs> but I want to say something. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very... Um, I'm going to rock the boat a lot. Okay? 
let me put things in perspective, folks. All right. The real reason, one of the main reasons why we need to take a vaccine, because many Canadians are nasty. That's the, one of the real reasons, folks. Now you may think, Warren, what are you talking about? Well, let, let me let me let me explain here, okay? Many times pre 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 COVID, I would go to the gym. I kid you not. Mm. Oh, you see your shit. You know what? You see where you. I think you know where I'm going with this. And I'd walk into washrooms. People would use the wa public washroom, eh? Use number, go in number two, go in number one, and walk out that washroom <laughs> like nothing ain't happened. And go and shaking other people's hands Ugh. and touching other knobs. I was in the gym recently. They have the luckily that you can go. You get to the gym here in Ottawa. Some gyms allow you to go to the gym. I tore my meniscus. They just say I'm in the gym. I kid you not. A man took out a tissue in the middle of the gym and blow his nose and put it back in his pocket and do this and touch the, and touch the railing. You <laughs> need to tell me. Yeah. Think about how you get, think about how you get the cold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to touch a railing? And you forget you touch your hand and go like this. Oh or you go pick up the hamburger and go like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The real reason is not saying we are all nasty because we have so, a lot of people who – L, have I lived in your house before? <laughs> Dr. Vibe, have I lived in your house before? No. Sarah, have I lived in your house before? Cesar, have I lived in your house before? Well, he's not saying anything. But, no, the point I'm trying to make here is – we don't know how people clean up after themselves in their own home. Yeah. Facts, Warren. <laughs> we can, Big facts. We can. That part, that part. We were all clean and know how to wash your hands. Yep. And put on the mask. Yeah. And don't touch certain things. Or if you touch certain things, wipe it off. We wouldn't yep. need a vaccine in the first. We wouldn't even get the flu. True. So there is a reason why we need to get the vaccine. Black Canada talking then. Take it that way. All right. Sorry, Caesar. <laughs> Go ahead, Caesar. Allow me to agree very much with all my uh, colleagues said. And, uh, you know, with respect to the suspicions that us Black people worldwide have towards vaccinations, and it's very legitimate. I'll give a good uh, documentary, uh, documented history in terms of, you know, why Black people are suspicious of vaccinations whether you talk about the Tuskegee's and syphilis in the Americas or even HIV and others in Africa. But, um, and with much respect to my brother Warren, uh, being vulnerable about his daughter, I myself am uh, born in Africa. I would not be alive today without vaccines. And even when I look at my own life as an adult, I have a very rare allergy to a fruit that's too often associated to black people, watermelon. But watermelon kills me. I am dead wow. allergic. Can you imagine if I went around telling people that because watermelon for me is deadly, you should not eat watermelon? And if I were to even wrap it in Pan-Africanism and white people conspiracy to make us look like apes, people will find me ridiculous. So much respect, because we all have brothers and sisters in our communities who are anti-vaccine much respect to them. But there comes a point when we cannot deny that this uh, COVID situation, which is very much linked to capitalism and therefore systemic racism, disproportionately affects Black people. And as such, we must, with all recognition that yes, some people do get sick after getting the vaccine. Some people even die, but guess what? Some people also die right driving their car with the seatbelt on. Are you going to stop wearing the seatbelt? Some people actually die from drinking water. Are you going to dare stop drinking water? We can go on and on and on, but there comes a point, like so many other topics, it's not a rational conversation. It's purely emotional and in terms of one person making their own choices. I am those speaking in concert with my colleagues speaking in solidarity to Brother Warren, speaking in reflection to the child that I was, who is alive to you today, thanks to vaccines. You, you would see my baby pictures. Some of them are cute. Some of them, you're like, 
how is he alive? Mm-hmm. Get the vaccine, my black people. Mm-hmm. Important also that we do see black medical uh, health uh, professionals. Um, my uh, my sister-in-law, Dr. Flavia, herself uh, is one who was on a panel uh, encouraging black people to get vaccine. Do it for yourselves. Do it for our future generations. And also, one thing about vaccines. vaccines. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say African people invented vaccines anyway. So the idea that people are acting like this is new, like yeah. smallpox vaccine came from us. White yeah. people were dying, getting deformed, you know? And then when they're like Benjamin Franklin, it was his black slave. Like that guy was like, oh, no, we have, we, we take care of this in Africa. So this is our technology. It's not actually something being imposed on us by white people. It's an established technology that we actually invented and we forget our history of science. So I just wanted to and- say that first, Sarah. And that's perfect because what I was going to talk about was Dr. Keziah Corbett. Hello. I got Moderna. I was praying I would get Moderna because this black sister was one of the people that helped develop the Moderna anti-COVID-19 vaccine. And Elle is right. Before we start spreading conspiracy theories, we need to do what César often does, go way back into you know, antiquity, look at our very deep, 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 deep history on the continent in terms of herbal, re- herbal remedies and, and uh, you know, natural medicines and the indigenous people as well. You know? All right. Don't believe the hype, get <laughs> vaccinated. All right. Well, folks, I know time is fleeting, so I'm going to I'm going to make a decision on one more topic. Did we do Miss Universe? Can I talk about that really quickly? <laughs> Got to be really quick. Cause you're, be the super only, quick. You're, you're, you're the only person who knows about who knows this. about this. I will be two minutes. But this is why I think we should talk about it. First of all, I know Miss Nova Stevens is probably not watching us, but I think it's really important that black Canadians express some solidarity with her. So I'm going to do so. And hopefully if anyone's watching and you have social media, maybe express this. So very quickly, we had the first black Miss Universe Canada, and she's absolutely stunning. She's a South Sudanese woman, gorgeous and dark skinned. So you can see where I'm going with this. She's faced international racism, in particular from the Philippines. Um, So they started saying that, because they're big on pageants. I don't know that they're particularly more anti-Black than anyone else's. Everybody's anti-Black and they're anti-Black as well and also big in pageants. So they started saying she didn't look like a human being. She was a beast. They're scared of her. Canada, how is this person rapping Canada? She should be rapping Africa, like all this terrible stuff. So then this young woman came on social media and made herself vulnerable and spoke about this. And because many of the people that are harassing her are Filipino, they started saying she was anti-Asian and she got even more harassment. Then she went to the the um, contest and her gowns didn't show up, Filipino Ooh. designer. Um, so she didn't make the top 21 and she kept it to herself, but one of her team went on social media and said the gown showed up late and they didn't fit. And we had to like get this different gown. And it was like this whole thing. So everyone started saying she was ungrateful and disgusting and she's got bullied even more. And now this poor woman has like death threats online. Like people are telling her to kill herself. They're saying that she's a disgusting person. So I just wanted us to address it really briefly. That's, not, that's all there really is to it. It's like Miss Universe pageant drama, but Miss Nova Stevens is an absolute goddess. She's absolutely stunning. She's handled herself with complete class in the face of all of this. She even apologized on behalf of her team to these designers. Um, And I just wanted to express solidarity with her. She's an absolutely gorgeous, wonderful woman. She also is like super pro-black. She does like Black Lives Matter protests. Like she's for the people and she's out here as our queen. And I'm not big into beauty pageants or anything, but like when we have a sister that's doing like this and facing this kind of violence, that's all I wanted to say on it. So, yeah. Cesar? And allow me to very quickly add uh, to what Elle just said. I was aware of the situation. Allow me to mention that the Philippines is one of those countries, just as India and Brazil, that have deep-rooted anti-Black racism in terms of their culture. Very few people are aware of this. There is a Black indigenous population in the Philippines, the Aitas, that you do not see. And the Philippines, uh, Filipinos themselves, tend to be regarded as the lowest of Asians in terms of comparison to those who are lighter skinned, the Chinese, the Koreans, and the Japanese, and them Filipinos tending to be darker, but also more impoverished 
than others. And as such, it's uh, inward. Just another very quickly thing that I will add. Let's look back in history. We are in 2021. Some of you may remember that movie from uh, Mario Van Peebles, Posse. Posse, that also yeah. you see the notion of Buffalo, uh, Buffalo Riders. Yeah. It actually comes from a true fact where the children of the slaves that got liberated in 1865, the children were the first group of blacks into the US Army. The shock to them when at the end of the 19th century, Teddy Roosevelt, in declaring war to the Spanish crown in the US Spanish War, American soldiers went to fight in the Philippines. Philippines, named after King Philip of Spain, by the way. The Philippines and the black soldiers, descendant of black people who were enslaved, had the shock to be fighting for a white army against, in many parts of the Philippines, indigenous black people. This is one of those taboos about the Philippines. In mentioning that, Miss Cameroon was at the Miss Universe. Her beautiful outfit of the lion and everything was conceived by a Filipino man, a young man. It's not all Filipinos, but it's a societal problem. And yes, Philippines as India, Brazil, America and Canada, France and England, et cetera, et cetera, has a problem of systemic racism. Thank you for bringing it up, Al, and solidarity to our sister in Nova Scotia. Okay. Warren, how much time do you got? Because I know you're usually tight for time. As you enjoy, he's on mute. Well, I'm here. He has two minutes. Sorry, five minutes. I okay. So I'm going to, uh, we'll have one last conversation piece and you're going to, you're going to start it. So if you have to duck out before we end, at least you have some input. Okay. I'll put it out there. The black community and the Israeli Palestine conflict. Warren, you start. Um, okay. So number one, a lot of people may or may not know this. I'm going to start from um, the Isra um, uh, Israel perspective first, because there's a lot of black Hebrews, or black Is Israelites living uh, in Israel. And they are being pushed out of Israel right now um, because they're not, they're not even considered uh, to be true um, Hebrews or Israelites uh, from a religious context. And I think that's the focus, particularly when it comes to black lives um, uh, in this whole conflict. I think the entire conflict is horrible. Um, you know, I'm not going to get too much into the religious or the, the land co you know, uh, conversation, but let's focus on the black bodies or black people, respectfully, who are, who are ex experiencing anti-black racism, particularly during this conflict. There are people that, those people, many of those people living there has been applying or applied for status for years now and hasn't received it. And now the, the height of the, the conflict is at an all time high, not in comparison to other years. Um, they're now being threatened to be, um, you know, uh, uh, threatened to enforce out of the country. So I think when we talk about, you know, this conflict, I think, yeah, it's yes, it's important to recognize the lies generally, um, not looking at race or being impacted. But since the question is particularly in terms of black people, it's black people who are getting the um, the, 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 the terrible end of the stick, um, and it's not even broadcasted. It's not newsworthy. And not a lot of people even know this. That's happening, right? These are people for, or have been peaceful people, growing their own food, uh, particularly planting their own uh, fruits and vegetables, you know, you're praying from a religious perspective, really creating a relationship of solidarity, not only among themselves, but with other Israelites. And they're still being pushed out of the country. So we've got to think about it. Do we want to assimilate to whiteness? And if we assimilate, at what cost? Because we always end up villainized at the end. Every single time we, this we, we attempt to do it. You know, going back to what Sarah mentioned, respectfully in terms of, you know, this, you know, as things change with George Floyd, yeah, the capitalism is, is, is on the rise when it comes to black people and, our, and explaining our, our, our labor and our, and our, and our black experience. That's what's happening. You know, that's not assimilation. That's exploitation, right? And those who don't understand, you need to read some Franz Fanon, please. You know, because when we think about what whiteness is doing to us, whiteness is always in control. Let's talk about, again, as the example I mentioned earlier, 
Let's talk about implementing some black Canadian history in our, in, in, in our curriculums. Let's do that. Why don't we start there? You know, up to now, we can't. We, we had a government that implemented, not saying we shouldn't, right? You know, that's a de another debate for another time. You know, put in a curriculum that appreciated to us LGBTQ community members and their lived experience. Then we had a government that, 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 that the new or the, the, the now gov sitting government you know, reverted that to, um, they reverted the, the curriculum back to the, the, the curriculum of 1985 or 1990. And yet, there has been no talk about black Canadian histories. We want to talk about, we're seeing changes about black black people. There's no changes. This has been happening for years, people. Anyways, I'm going to stop there because i got to run. But All right, Warren, how, how can people touch base with you? Oh, man, uh, my new website is new. Oh, oh whoa, yeah, whoa. Hot. So warrenclark.ca, so go check it out. All right. All right. Take care, Warren. Be All well. Right, we'll chat. Keep the I'll, faith. We'll, we'll connect. All right. Okay. Well, folks, you got some more time so you can continue the co the conversation point, point that uh, Warren laid the foundation for. Who'd like to jump in next? Sarah. And and I'm and I'm going to keep it short because Cesar really is is more well versed in uh, the Afro. Both of us are continental Africans, but Cesar is more likely to be able to give you a more fulsome uh, picture. So I grew up actually my my entire life. I was just telling you before the show. From age six, my father, who was a who was a career diplomat was uh, we were watching the olympics in 72 in munich and i'm aging myself and i i did not understand why these hooded men were having to hold up these israeli athletes and all of this and all of that and for whatever reason my father decided okay this is the time to tell this child what the real deal is so he explained to me about you know palestinians and israelis and how that came about and how they were on the land and these other people came and decided no they need to be squeezed all the way to you know a strip of land and then the occupation and what was going on and why these people were resorting to these tactics so from age six so this is over 40 years i've been hearing this and it was different prime minister like the prime ministers changed the problem really did not and in fact it seemed to get more complicated with time with the added involvement of Iran and you know Hezbollah and the Lebanese next door and you know all kinds of different entities. But it in my mind, I'm still trying to figure out. You came to a piece of land and you found some people on that land. You tried to snatch it by force, it didn't work. So there was a war. And then all these you know uh, foreign entities intervened and helped you win. Okay, you settle on the land, good for you. Can you not share that land? Can you not respect that there were people there before you with lives and farms and olive trees and livelihoods and their own religion and you know doing their thing? No, you need to bring in people from Europe, from the US, from the UK, from France. You need to bring a whole bunch of other people so you can further settle the land. The word settle, that doesn't work for me. Occupy, so you can go and then, when those people get mad, you're mad. And you decide you have a right to defend yourself. Oh, okay. And then you put up a wall and then you make conditions such that these people cannot get any proper gainful employment. Their economy is on its knees. The young people there have no hope, zero hope, zero, nothing. They cannot aspire to anything. You have taken all their hope. Intifada, number one, number two, number three, and so on and so on. You wonder why they're always in the street. Well, what else are they going to do? If they try negotiated settlements, you find ways to go and undermine that, you sabotage it, and you're back to square one. And nothing changes for them. Misery, misery, generation after generation. What do you expect? And what really gets me, I know I'm going to come off as an anti-Semite. I am not. 
And I have Jewish friends. I have Jewish family for crying out loud. But at the end of the day, from someone who comes from a country that was occupied, it was occupied from the 1800s to 1963 by white people, okay? Who came from Europe and decided, oh, these savages, no. They don't know what they're doing. We're going to come here and civilize them, okay? And in fact, some of them are still there. They didn't all leave. <laughs> Forgive me if I feel some sort of empathy for the Palestinian people. And that would explain partly why the African Union, formerly the OAU back in the day, decided to boycott Israel for those many, many decades because they could sympathize with the fate of the Palestinians. And I'm going to stop there and let Cesar give like a proper... Well, let, let El go. I'm going to also say Cesar can close us. I'll yes, be, I'll be quick. yes. Um, Cause then Cesar can finish up. Sarah, that was, that was a uh, brilliant and wonderful. The only thing I want to add too is for current, um, the current black struggle. So much of the technologies of policing and prisons are coming. Yeah, the Israelis. Yeah. So yeah. Um, people have talked about this is George Floyd, like the restraint yeah. techniques being used. No, those are the Israelis. Yeah. And, Mossad, and the way we are policed in Africa, in some countries, the squads, the secret service, Mossad trained mm -hmm. Israelis. And when you go, so like our police chief trained in Quantico, the FBI, and they're trained by Israelis and they bring that back. So it's not like we need to bring anti-blackness into Canada, it's already here, but our cops go and train in the most racist uh, incarcerated nation in the world, also with Israelis and bring those techniques. So when we think about the new frontier of policing, which is like data collection surveillance, that's all developed by Israel or like, so um, like HP products, they actually run like the data that, tracks like Palestinians and keeps them out of the territories and they apply that to us. So if black people are saying, you know, why does the struggle matter to us? It's across the world. Besides the fact that we should all be internationalists um, is that quite literally the techniques being developed on a population, the Palestinians who are essentially in an open air prison tomorrow show up on our bodies here. So that is another reason. That's all I wanted to say. And Cesar, go ahead. Hey. Cesar, you're on mute. Yes. Okay. Um Honestly, um, thank you so much to my sisters, El, especially Sarah. Uh, Brother Warren expressed himself. Um, my comments may offend some, just to let you know, because last week on my Facebook, uh, prior to me being uh, blocked for a week, there oh. was... Uh, oh, no, that's fine. Uh, when you're blocked on Facebook, it either means you did something really stupid or you're doing great work. So, I am we, we believe it's the latter. We'll go with the latter. Uh, because I shared something, a message. It wasn't originally my message. Uh, I explained that some people did not want to understand it. Uh, talking to black people, um, stop posting about Israel and Palestine. We are black people. We have. We need to deal with our issues first. Regarding the Israel-Palestine situation and how it affects black people, the focus I want to bring, uh, when I say the focus I want to bring, first of all, everything Sarah said is absolutely truthful. Everything else said is absolutely truthful. It is, it is not possible to deny the similarities in terms of colonization and racism that uh, blacks in Africa and also the Americas face and as such, we cannot be see how uh, the links regarding police brutality are apparent. That said, I also want to be careful here in telling black people, do not go get involved yourself per se in a conflict that doesn't, that is not directly your conflict. I will explain myself. I have walked for Palestine last year uh, in the Black Lives Matter protest, I clearly said, free Palestine. And I remind people that we need to support the cause of Palestinian people. When I say we, I include Jewish people as well, because there are many Jews who do support a free Palestine. Free Palestine does not mean the uh, does not mean that because you're anti-Zionist, that means you're anti-Semitic. That is a lie by Israeli propaganda. Uh, it also does not mean at all that you support Hamas and 
rocket bombings of Israeli cities and, and civilians. That is a lie. And it definitely does not mean a free Palestine from uh, whatever, um, from the coast to the sea or some expression meaning to push his, uh, Jewish people to the sea. That is a lie. That said, it is important, and this is the point that I wanted to highlight last week in my post. The, it, it wasn't a post, it was actually a profile uh, photo cover. We as black people cannot let ourselves be divided by an Israeli-Palestine conflict when Israelis and, Palestine, and Palestinians do not divide themselves over black lives. Perfect example, uh, we have too many black Christians supporting Israel because of what the pastors and evangelical pastors are telling them. Uh, in Kenya, I, I was sent this, Reverend Lucy Natasha holding a pray for Israel. In the United States, we have black people, black evangelicals, black from the prosperity church supporting Israel at any cost as part of the movement called the Christian Zionists. They are supporting Israel as the land of Jesus Christ and the rapture coming, et cetera, et cetera. You see the weight of religion intersecting with race in geopolitics, very dangerous. When from Africa, as we know, uh, example, People, many people in Central Africa supporting Israel because they have been Christianized by force. We even have the, uh, the Congolese president, Felix Tshisekedi, who went last year to APAC to basically throw himself to the APAC, the, the most pro-Israeli lobby group, giving DR Congo in relations. We need to be careful because when we are saying as black people that we support Israel, we tend to forget the fate of those that wrongfully black people even call falashas. It's in Misa. Falasha means the landless, the Ethiopian Jews. It's the beta Israel who are victim of systemic racism, who protest like us blacks in Nova Scotia, in Ontario, in the US and in Brazil against a police state. Being, uh, when black people are being pro-Israel, they are basically supporting a state that is mistreating and pushing away African refugees in an ethnocentric and Jewish state type of mentality that goes against democracy because they fear all these black people coming in and they're going to reproduce and their number is going to grow and they're going to replace them. I'm being truthful here. Just I'm being truthful. We were talking about vaccines. Thousands of Ethiopian Jew women in the 80s and 90s were vaccinated, aka poisoned, provera mm -hmm. by the Ministry of Health of Israel, making them infertile because the belief was that Africans all have AIDS. And let's not forget that Africans are often referred to as Kushi, which means technically darker people from the Bible, Kush. In reality, that refers to as apes. At the same time, yes, there is that black solidarity with Palestine because of colonization. Just behind me, as you can see, the three black leaders sitting there all voice their support to Palestine. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Nelson Mandela. Absolutely in terms of colonization. However, I want to remind my black people, beyond colonization and beyond police brutality, let us dare to be honest. Afro-Palestinians, you never hear about them. Google them on YouTube. They are victims of racism, and they clearly say they are victims of racism by the white Palestinians, a.k.a. the Arab Palestinians. They are complaining of systemic racism. They're complaining of being called Abid, a.k.a. slaves. They are complaining of not even being represented. I'm sorry to say this. As a director in the government, provincial in provincial institutions of child welfare, uh, uh, regional director of equity, diversity, and inclusivity, someone like me does not exist in the Arab world, but someone like me can exist in Israel. We have to be able to have these complex strategic conversations where at the end of the day, Israel-Palestine means nothing if me as a black person, I'm called a Kushi in Israel and I'm calling a bead in Palestine. Of course, you have the situations that happen where even further to that, 
to what extent? And I am not here telling you do not support Palestine. I said it last year. I've protested. I've been on panels. But we need to, you know, with this Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, and the fact that we are becoming more knowledgeable of our history. 2017, uh, uh, slaves in Libya, black people, all these images. How many protests happened in North Africa and the Middle East, including Palestine, to end slavery of black people in Libya? None. When we have a country like Senegal and Mauritania that are holding protests in support of Palestine, show me the protests that happened in Palestine for Senegalese and for Mauritania where blacks are still slaves. The Haratin are still, people who look like us on the screen in Mauritania, Mauritania, a country that Canada does business with. People who look like us on the screen, on the screen are slaves there. This is not 1850. This is not 500 years ago. It's right now. So hmm. the point that I'm saying, I am not here to care so much to tell you be pro-Palestine or be pro-Israeli. Basically, support Palestine because of victim of colonization or support Israel because anti-Semitism. When you have anti-Semitism, you have anti-Black racism. It's that simple. What I'm saying is do not let the conflicts of others divide you because Israelis and Palestinians are not dividing themselves over anything that concerns black people. They are not. Black people, the, the level of, uh, I don't want to say mental slavery for anyone to feel insulted, but the level of alienation and the desire for us to fit in, to be accepted, is making us take in conflicts where nobody's asking for us to support them I'm sorry to tell you this, black people. Palestinians just as Israelis really don't care about black people supporting us. They will welcome our support, but they will not risk their lives for our support. And as a last example, and I'm sorry to take the time, I will give a very concrete example of things that happen. When we have black people in Ferguson, as so many other cities, including in Canada, just as then in South Africa, victim of police brutality, Al said it so well, most of these police corps are trained not to be true Israeli trainers who are gaining practices on the Palestinians. We must denounce that. However, at the same time I'm saying that, when we have the few black intellectuals that we have will get to have airtime, will get to be on the screen for mass viewing. And I take the example here of our brother, Mark Lamont Hill, who made each of the United Nations in which he said free Palestine, and he ends up suffering the cost of it, notably being removed from CNN. Where was the Palestinian outrage? Where was the Palestinian protest? Where is the Palestinian person, intellectual, who has risked their career for saying Black Lives Matter? None. At the end of the day, first and foremost, I'm a Pan-Africanist, and my elders behind me were Pan-Africanists. We must never support the cause of another people when we don't have the full picture, and when at the end of the day, those who look like us in Israel are called Kushis, and our people are protesting against systemic racism. In Palestine, they're called Abid, slaves, and our people are also speaking on systemic racism. That's why I think it's important we talk about this. Let us focus first and foremost on our community. Let us support second or third level, because at the end of the day, as El said, Anti-black racism is global and nobody is looking at us to support them. But too often we look at supporting the cause of other people as if we want to go uh, throw water on the house on fire of the neighbor and we forget our own house is on fire with our people burning. That's what I wanted to say. Wow. <laughs> that is quite a finish, folks. You see what you've done, Sarah, by joining us? What, what kind of madness you cause, girl? Come on now. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> well, this, this is the first time. on fire. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Well, look. But it's important. Oh. I think our, our, our community, but, uh, and I'm going to explain here uh, because, as Elle said, in terms of um, you know, internationalism or universalism, I always say universalism is a lie to black people because at the end of the day, everything we see. It's not about us. <laughs> yeah. It's not about us. Yeah. However, as we are progressing, and I think there's a shift that happened with last year, mm -hmm. we have our black communities asking, yes, we need to see more Sarahs and more L, but we also need to see, as we saw um, our sister on CBC, Ginella Massa, a black face on CBC, yeah. we also need to have more 
education in terms of our history. Like I always tell black people, stop thinking the richest man in history, Mansa Musa, is a good thing. It wasn't a good thing. I will explain that another time. But we also need to have more complex conversations in terms of just as we just had now regarding Israel-Palestine conflict where we don't have all the cards. I mean, I'm going to tell you this, my brothers and sisters, the whole uh, Black and Arab solidarity was actually a creation by the Saudi government in the early 60s as Western nations stamped out slavery and for them to get back at Israel. We are being pounded. We are being pounded by people who don't look to stand up for us. I'm sorry to say this, my friend. Elle had, Elle had something to say. No, not at all. Um, I just actually have to go as well. <laughs> so, I don't okay. Know. <laughs> okay, so Elle. No, that's great. Uh, how, how, yeah. could, how could people get a hold of you? Uh, they can email me, el.jones at msvu.ca. Um, we can try and get it on my Facebook. But that ain't happening. Ain't happening. Sorry. Um, I'm at my friend limit and they don't let you have more. So mostly you can send me an email. And oh, look, great to have you. I'm glad sorry, we, uh, no, no, it's all right. I'm glad you could join. May, it's kind of a jammed up day. I don't know why. And it was great to see you. Sorry to join late. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Cesar. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Take care. Uh, Sarah, how can people get in touch with you? Well, I do radio, so CHUO 89.1 FM in Ottawa. They can, uh, I co-host a show called Black on Black, and we do this kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> so um, Black on Black 891 at Hotmail.com. Black on Black 891 at Hotmail.com. Thank you. And Cesar? You can reach me on Facebook, Cesar Rimi, uh, Cesar Rimi, R-I-M-Y. And my backup account when I'm blocked, Cesar Rimi. <laughs> <laughs> now, if, if you know me, honestly, don't worry. When I'm blocked, it's a good thing. Trust me. All it's right. Well, <laughs> thanks to Warren. Thanks to L. Thanks to Sarah. Thank you, Cesar. Thank you all. This is an incredible conversation. And I think having Sarah has, has kicked it up a notch, as Emeril Lagasse has said. So we are so happy to have you, Sarah. Thank you so much for everything that you do, you have done, are doing, and will be doing. And that's to all our panelists. Thank you so much. I am Dr. Vibe, I'm host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations, 2020 Best Podcast News Award winner and 2018 award winner in the innovation category given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. And I also host the only online show in the world for dads and fathers that is sponsored by Dove Men Care and Dad Central. And I am the global board chair for the, I'm the board chair for the Global Food and Drink Initiative, a multi multimedia not-for-profit that showcases blacks in the diaspora that are doing their thing in food, wine, and travel. As always, I'd like to thank the people who caught this live, Ryan, LJ and other and Sylvia and others who I didn't get to. I, it's my head, not my heart, but look forward to catching this on the replay audio and video wise. Live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Block assumptions. Aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. Love, faith, and respect. Remember to give yourself grace. Thank you, BIA Media, for the great production. God bless. Peace to you all. Keep the faith and walk good.